35 to 44 percent of your region's examination will be on this unit, that is algebra. We're going to go over linear equations, quadratics, and sequences slash series. There's also a super important topic, focus and directrix, that will definitely be on your readings exam and has been for years now. We'll look at it, but firstly, let's look at some linear stuff. Now, linear functions or linear equations are just functions with a degree of 1 and are always straight lines when drawn in a graph, and they always have a clear slope too. Right here we see some examples of a positive slope, negative slope, zero slope, and undefined slope. Slope, which is also known as the average rate of change, or AROC, change of change in y over change in x, rise over run, it can also be found by taking the y value at b at some x value b minus the y value at a, some x value of a, over the b minus a value. If this didn't make sense, think of it this way. b and a are different x values, and when we plug in those x values to an equation f of x, we're going to get some sort of y value. So this was really just saying change in y over change in x in a different way. Now let's take this example here. We have two points that is 3, 6, and 0, 4. And our change in y here we see is positive 2. Our change in x is positive 3. So our slope is 2, 3, or 2 thirds because we have that change in y over change in x. Now when we see a linear equation in the form y equals mx plus b, right, m is the slope and b is the y-intercept, or it might be the starting value in a word problem. Now, point slope form, as seen in the second thing right here, uses the same m for slope, but includes some sort of random point in the line. Now, let's say here we could take the, that point we had earlier, 3, 6, to take the places of y1 and x1, so we would get y minus 6 equals 2 thirds times x minus 3. Now, this should all be reviewed from Algebra 1, but what's new in Algebra 2 is three variable linear systems. If these show up in a multiple choice question, what you should be doing is just using the Linsol function or calculator, and we have another video to that. Be sure to check it out as a calculator guide to Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 regions examinations. On short answer questions, though, you'll be required to show your work, so just doing a little bit of a calculator hack is not going to help you. Here's a six-step pl plan that you could do that. The first thing you're going to do is group your first and second equation, and then you're also your second and third equation. Then you're going to eliminate the same variable from both systems, consolidate both systems to one equation, use those new equations you just got to make a new system, then eliminate another variable, and then once you find that and solve for that variable, you're going to go back and find the other two. And that sounded pretty complicated, so let's go over it with a little bit of an example. Let's say I have this three variable system, x plus y plus z equals 1, 2x plus 4y plus 6z equals 2, negative x plus 3y minus 5z equals 11. So we're going to split it off again. We have the first group here. We have g1, our first group is the first two equations. We have g2 is our second two equations. And if you do not know how to solve a two variable system of equations, then you should probably go back and review your notes or take a look at your Algebra 1 stuff because this should all be reviewed from Algebra 1. Now, once we take this first group here, we're going to multiply that top equation by negative 2 so we can cancel out the x's. We're left with 2y plus 4z equals 0. Likewise, we're going to multiply this one by 2 so we can get rid of those x's. We're going to get 10y minus 4z equals 24. And we see we've completed this step right here. We have eliminated the same variable from both systems. That We have eliminated the x variable. Now we're going to use these two new equations that we just got here. We're going to make a new system of equations. That is 2y plus 4z equals 0 and 10 y minus 4 z equals 24. We're going to solve for one of the equations. We eliminated this 4 right here just by adding them together. We're going to get that y equals 2. And now that we have that, we can go back and use this equation that we just had here to solve for z. We get z equals negative 1. Now we're going to go back and take this equation all the way back up here that had the three variables pretty plainly. And we're going to insert the things that we know that are now equal to y and the thing that we know is now equal to z. And we're going to get that x is equal to 0. So our final solution here is that y equals 2, z equals negative 1, and x equals 0. Alrighty, next up is quadratics. So we are going to start with quadratics right over here. Quadratics are pol polynomials with a degree of 2 and have a U or a horseshoe shape. Their standard form for an equation is right here. We have Y equals AX squared plus BX plus C. They are also symmetrical and their standard and their axis of symmetry is right here where we have negative B over 2A. B and A are the same values that we see here in our standard form equation, right? If your quadratic is not in the form AX squared plus BX plus C, where A, B, and C are all integers, you need to take a look and reevaluate and then manipulate your form or your equation algebraically so you can get it into standard form. Now, the sum of the roots and the product of the roots are illustrated by these two equations, again, using the same B and A. Roots, of course, are just your X-intercepts or your zeros. 
Let's also take a look at the quadratic formula. This is a formula that is given to you on your reference table, but it is very helpful to have memorized. Not too hard to memorize. If you haven't found the quadratic formula song, you might as well give that to Google. Um, anyhow, the discriminant is the most important part of this formula, since we've already gone over what this means. Again, this is the axis of symmetry. This discriminant is basically just this little bit here, b squared minus 4ac. What this does is it determines the number of real roots and the nature of those roots. So if you plug in those b, a, and c from before, and it is negative, that means there are no x-intercepts, no real x-intercepts, no real roots. So you have complex roots, but there are no x-intercepts, no zeros. This also means that basically your function never hits the x-axis, so it has a y-intercept that is not zero. All right, if it's zero, then we have one x-intercept. If it's two, we have two x-intercepts. And if that number, this number here, ends up being a square number, then when we apply the square root function, it's just to become a regular integer, which means that we would have a rational root. But if it wasn't, then we would have a square root up here still, and it would be an irrational root. And now you've, of course, been waiting for the torture of focus and directrix. This is on every regions exam and is usually a two or four point question every year it's on there. They are removing this from the curriculum for the 2025 to 2026 school year, but until then, we are stuck with focus and directrix. Now, the focus of a quadratic is essentially a point on the line of symmetry that is the same distance. So this distance here is equal to this distance from the line known as the directrix. Let's list this line right here. These are both perpendicular to the line of symmetry, and this distance right here from here to here and from here to here is known as p. So from here all the way down to here, that would be 2p. All right, and this occurs at the same x value as the turning point or the min or max. Now, if we have a quadratic, we can write it in this thing called vertex form, which is right here. All right, you just have to do some more algebraic manipulation to switch from standard form to vertex form or whatever form you would have. And what we do is we write the vertex in the form hk, with h being the x value of the turning point right here, and k being the y value. Right. The equation to find the focus is h comma k plus p since the point, the directrix is y equals k minus p, and the vertex form is y equals x minus h squared over 4p plus k. All right. This all applies for only a vertical parabola, so when the things are going vertical, they're going up or down or whatever. Now if your arrows are going left to right, then we have a horizontal parabola. And these are the rules. We're basically just going to switch the h's and the k's, the x's and the y's, because we are going in the other direction. You can take a look, pause the video, and write some notes if that is what you need to do. But we are going to move on to a practice problem. I usually don't include these in unit summary videos, but this is important to consolidate our knowledge. This is from the June 2023 practice regents. Um, it was, there was a similar problem on the January 2024 regents, but I like this one better. So our answer is 2, I'm just going to give that to you straight away, but if you want to pause the video, which I highly recommend doing, and check your work, see what you get. Alright, so the directrix is y equals 4, and we know that this means that it's a vertical parabola because only a vertical parabola has y in it, right? A, a horizontal one would have x. Alright, so we know this is a vertical parabola. We know that y equals k minus p from our work over here. That means that therefore 4 equals k minus p, and k equals p plus 4 if we do a little algebraic manipulation. Likewise, if we use our point here from the focus, and we have h, um, comma k plus p, we know that h is 0, right, because it just has to be 0, and we know that k plus p equals 6, which means that k is also equal to 6 minus p. Now, these are both equal to k, so we can set them equal to each other, and we get that p equals 1 after a little algebra, which also means that when we plug p back into here, we get 6 minus 1 equals k, so 5 equals k. Now we have that final equation, we have our h value, we have our k value, we have our p value, h is 0, p is 1, k is 5. We can plug that into this equation here for vertex form, we get this equation, we do a little algebraic manipulation, that looks a lot like our answer right here. Alright, final thing, we've got sequences and series. Sequences are lists formed with terms, and series are basically just the sum of those terms, and there are two types of sequences, arithmetic and geometric. Arithmetic sequences are like linear equations, you just add or subtract to get to the next term. You might have heard these as now or next equations. Geometrics are like exponential, you multiply or divide by some sort of ratio or number to get to the next term, and unlike equations, these are only defined for the integers, they are not defined for decimals or anything in between. So while a linear equation like y equals x is defined for something like x equals 1.5, it would not be defined like that for an arithmetic or, for an arithmetic or a geometric sequence. 
All right, there's two different types of equations for sequences. We have explicit types and recursive types. So the explicit one is used to find the nth term, while the recursive is used to find the next term. All right, here are the equations of those below in a little bit of a table. All right, note that d is the common difference between terms, which is basically the amount you need to get from one term to the next, while r is the common ratio, which is the amount that you need to multiply or divide by to get to the next term. Pause the video and take a little note on this if you want to write these down. These are not on your reference table. Now, finally, we have sigma notation. Sigma notation is pretty simple as well. We're going to use the sum symbol to add up terms in a sequence, and you can use your calculator sigma notation to easily find the sum of a sequence. And here's an example if I were to do it by hand. We see here that this 4 means that our last term is 4. We saw that from this right here. All right, we see that 2 is our first term. We see this right here. And we said this is the equation that we need to use to plug this into. So we're going to have to plug in 2 first, then we're going to plug in 3, and then we're going to stop at 4. So we put this all together, we put it in, we put in the equation, then we get that our final answer is 21. Your calculator can do this for you. Now, geometric series formula. This is pretty easy. Just find it on your reference table. This is the only thing that's on your reference table that's super helpful. Um, just plug in the same variables as we had down below, and it will give you your answer. This unit was definitely a lot, but the main things you got to remember is you have to know your algebra 1. You have to know things like completing the square I did not go over, stuff like that, factoring, etc. We talked about that a little bit in our first unit, but make sure that you know these concepts and have them fundamentally down so you can learn things that take it a step further, like our three variable linear systems and our focus and directrix.